Hey, welcome back to Appalachia the Expose. This is a big one for me. And I know I say that kind of stuff a lot, but you all know how all my career, I've talked about Barry Windham being an, uh, you know, a, uh, an influence on my career. Barry, it's great to have you, brother. Good to be here. We, I, I, the accolades, <laughs> I, could ha I could have to write them down. But let's go way back and start. I always tell the fans, this, these are the conversations we have on the road trips when we're on when we first meet each other. Uh, so obviously you're the son of Blackjack Mulligan, one yeah. of the big, big names of wrestling back in the 80s and, and before, but up to that point. And to me, the reason that's instrumental is because that's when wrestling, what the fans out there remember is WrestleMania and all this huge wrestling business. That was all built on the shores of like the Blackjack Mulligans, the Bruno San Martinez, mm -hmm. Dominic Tanucci's. Yeah. They laid that foundation that allowed that to happen. So uh, again, let's go way back. Uh, you, Kendall, your family, uh, your kids in Blackjack Mulligan's home. Well, when I was growing up, you know, my dad being on the road, you know, he was gone a lot. But, yeah. uh, you know, he was just, uh, he was a force to be reckoned with, that's oh, for sure. I bet. Didn't want to cross that, right? No, never <laughs> did. If, if for those fans out there that had never met Blackjack, he was a monstrously big man, just a very big, powerful man. Uh, quiet, as I recall. Well, he had an ego and a temper to match his size. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I just remember his hands. Like I, you know, I came into business, I was 205 pounds, and your dad was one of those guys that had those just meat hooks. Yeah, know, just huge, huge, huge. Yeah. So as as a kid, in the, you know, your, your dad's in the business. I'm sure you're obviously aware of what he's doing for a living. And uh, uh, first of all, it must have been pretty cool in school or in the neighborhood that your dad's blackjack mulligan. Well, you know, when we were growing up. We really didn't didn't really let it known, you know. Let it be known, that my old man was a wrestler. Yeah. Uh, when we got to the Carolinas, it kind of got out, and you know, I had buddies over at the house, you know, they, your dad's blackjack. Oh my gosh! <laughs> and Flair lived one house away, yeah. so you know, it, it evolved into you know my buddies coming over to see the guys and all that. But sure. Yeah. Sure. Now at this time, you're you know in your early teens and middle teens. Uh, was wrestling something you knew you were going to do, or was it? Did your dad talk about wrestling much at all? No, never talked about it at home, and uh, you know, and I didn't really have any aspirations to be a uh, wrestler. I was, uh, I went to school at West Texas State, and I was uh, roommates with Kelly Kaniski, and uh, I just think that you know that kind of propelled me towards it. Sure, sure, so. In an odd way, you being a son of Blackjack Mulligan, as a huge star of professional wrestling, you end up being drawn to the business, going through college and, and the wrestlers there. Because like every fan out there knows how, how instrumental West, Te West Texas State was in all the wrestlers that came through there. Yeah. Well, Murdoch lived right outside of town, and I was a big fan of Murdoch. So, yeah. yeah. yeah he was one of my buddies when I was growing up. So, it was a, it was a good time out there. Yeah. Now, when you guys were in college with it, all those guys, including Tito Santana, you, I mean, the, the long list of guys that had come through West Texas State, was it something you guys kicked around and said, hey, like, after senior year, we're going to go and do this? Or was it more like a, like a, a hobby, like something you guys sat around and watched together? You know, uh, I, I was, Tito was ahead of me, Tully was ahead of me, uh, Fernandez was there with me uh, his last year, my first year. Uh, and DiBiase was ahead of me. Everybody was ahead of me. So, you know, we never really said any of those up. names. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Bruiser Brody, Stan Hansen, uh, Terry Funk. Uh, yeah, we, we never sat around and talked about it, you know, or, or, or watched. It's yeah. just, uh, you know, I guess it was just natural progressions with the Funks being right there in town. And then, you know, uh, my dad and uh, Murdoch owned the Amarillo territory yeah. while I was out there. So, me just to go to school, just to go to work right there in Amarillo was easy yeah. hop. Step right, in, right yeah. into it. Uh, so like when, when you guys were, obviously like you and Kendall uh, sitting around watching television, you know your dad's a wrestler. I mean, you know what he's doing. The neighborhood may not. Uh, were you guys ever, I mean, <laughs> odd to say as, as big and powerful as Blackjack was, were you guys ever concerned that you watch something on TV and dad comes home a week later and something's messed up on them? Well, you know, we never watched the show at home. Wow. We, were all, we were busy with everything. And, uh, 
you know, it, uh, I would hear enough about it when I got to school on Mondays. Yeah. But uh, it was, uh, we didn't really watch it. And, and, you know, I guess it's just because he didn't uh, talk about it or anything at home. Yeah. Wow, that's great. Yeah, you know, again, because he, he wasn't just one of the guys in the business. He was one of the guys in the business. And, you know, honestly, I mean, I've got two sons and, you know, I... They never spoke the same thing, never spoke to them much about it, and rarely let them watch it. Uh, but, you know, they go to school and they'll come back, and you know, the same thing the kids talk to them about it. Uh, at what point did you make the conscious decision to, okay, I'm going to follow my dad's footsteps? Well, I was I was in Amarillo, and it was, or I was in Canyon, and it was summer, summer between uh, football. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, Mario Svoldi was out there running the territory for my dad, so he said, hey, why don't you come ref? So I started refereeing, and I refereed on Thursday nights there in Amarillo, and then I started going on the road, and then I started hauling the ring and refereeing and setting up the chairs and putting out posters. And so it was just became me and Mario running this whole operation for, for probably about six or eight months. But... Uh, that was just how it happened. Now, were you in your freshman year, junior year, uh, sophomore year, junior year when this all started? Uh, I was in between my football. freshman and sophomore. Okay, so yeah. I mean, you had a pretty busy schedule then. Practice of football, yeah. you know, carting the ring around and doing all that stuff. Uh, uh, but I, I always tell the fans that that really is the commonality the thread through all of us. That when you come in as a young boy, that was your job, right? To cart the ring, set it up, tear it down, and everything else. Yeah. Uh, and it really... Made, did in my case anyway made me really appreciate when I would get to the building and didn't have to set the ring up or offload it or pack it pack it away. Uh, so you're started dabbling in business in your between your freshman sophomore year. Uh, now that, as I recall the things that I heard, that was one of those really heavy driving territories, right? Oh yeah, yeah. three four thousand miles a week. Oh, you yeah. drive. You'd start in uh, Amarillo and go to Colorado Springs or either Denver, and then back to Albuquerque, down to El Paso, then to Odessa, and then a spot show, and then back. <laughs> and still doing your studies and still making football practice. Well, yeah. yeah. This was later on. after I refereed and, and hauled the ring and did all that for about a year. So it was it was after I'd finished it. I... Uh, I went back for uh, summer ball, and then I was there for the fall, and then uh, I don't know what it was. I got a decent paycheck, so I just went. <laughs> on, yeah, <laughs> it draws the attention, doesn't it? Yeah, I think I made like four or five hundred bucks one week, and that was it. It's loaded, <laughs> yeah, ready to go. Yeah, I had the money then. Yeah, all that college stuff, right? Gonna... So, uh, did you play football through the four years? No, just two. Okay, so after the wrestling starts picking up. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so, uh, I, I, my earliest recollections of you and watching it, like you were one of the guys that led my eye to it. But that would say Brad Armstrong, you. The, there were some guys you would watch on TV, and it looked a little bit like a show. They were good at what they did, but like watching guys like you and, and, and Brad, uh, to me, as a young athlete, and not aspiring to the business at this point, I would watch you guys and think to myself, that's what it would look like if it were a shoot, if it were real. This is how, it, the way Brad would move, the way you would sell. Uh, uh, and I always talk about this in the fans up there that follow me know, there's a picture, a famous picture of you uh, early in your career, where um, it looks like you're just getting ready to go into the comeback because your arms are down at your side and the veins are popping out of your neck you're like you just see this gutter like screaming. 18-inch net. Yeah. <laughs> but, but that would, to me, if somebody was beating the shit out of you for 10, 15, 20 minutes, and you finally got the swerve to, to get back on top, that looked to me real. Like, what would be, you finally got the up on this bastard, and now you're going to take it and do it. Yeah. And, and then, like, later, when, it, when Cable came into Pittsburgh, and we were finally able to see, because up until 76 or 7, we would get WWF, and I would read about the NWA in Florida and all these places in the magazines, but could never see it. Yeah. The first time I watched it, you were on. I can't recall your wrestling because I was so glued to you. And you took a big bump, a 
jumped off the top rope and did like a senton splash, and the person moved. And just the way you were, your body was moving and the way you were selling it, constantly finding the camera and things, uh, it, it just, not that I at that stage of my life even knew what any of that was, but like my eye, I always tell the fans that when you watch somebody and you can't take your eyes off of them, you know that's going to be a star, right? So like with your dad, uh, one of the things that stuck out to me was how different you and your dad's styles were. Yeah. It wasn't, you know, you know Blackjack was one of those big beat up, beat your ass type, type of guys. And you were in the wrestling and coming off the ropes and doing stuff. And when, when I learned that you were Blackjack's son, I thought that was a work. Because at the time, you guys didn't look like each other. Blackjack was just a huge man. You were that, that slender build, that athletic build. Uh, did your dad ever come to you and say, okay, kid, I, I watched your match last night and this or that. Don't do this or that. Start doing this or that. Uh, the, the most that he ever said to me was that I need to snug up. Yeah, yeah. And that was just because he worked so snug. Right. You know, it's like clotheslines and stuff like that. You, know, you can't rip a guy's head off, so you got to let it go. Right. And he was just, you know, but that was it. That's the most critique he ever gave me. Yeah. And, and you know, that, to me, there's a lot of prescience in that because, you know, you, I, again, you're coming to the business behind your father, who's this massive star, building your career. I would think that would get a bit weighty. You know, to have somebody like your dad come in and say, stop doing this and start doing that. Uh, so like, it sounds to me like your dad had a pretty good understanding of this, that A, you guys had different styles, and he saw something different for you and, and didn't want to come and butt into it. It's, uh, uh, you know, I always, this is the part of the business that always fascinates me because I look at Bruno and Dominic uh, and the way they trained me, the guys I got to work with and learn from. And there were so many different styles and everything. And it's, it almost seemed at one point to me just like a drowning. It's just too much to learn. Uh, did you ever reach that point? Well, you know, I spent a lot of time on the airplane wing of Eddie Graham's plane, you know, and, and talked for hours about the match. And, and I really think that's where I learned. Sure. Uh, but as far as, you know, it's just being overwhelming, I don't think so because, you know, I just... I just learned to relax in the ring right off the bat. You know, you just, you got to keep your head, you got to breathe. Right. And then that way, you know, you're aware of what's going on. I've seen so many guys who get there and just, you know, yeah. and, then, and then they just blow up and they can't do anything. Yeah. yeah. I, I was working a program in UWF with uh, Michael Hayes and uh, I his Buddy or, or, or Terry, but came time for my comeback, right? And the whole time I'm selling, I'm really selling hard right now. My lungs felt like this, you know. And afterwards, Michael Hayes pulled me aside and said, "Don't breathe." You know? yeah. and nobody ever told me that before. And I'm like, oh, it makes perfect sense, right? Uh, who were the influences on you? I mean, obviously, you're looking at your father, again, a huge star in the business. But again, I spent that that year of refereeing. I was around. I was Murdoch was there every night, so I was with him. I traveled with him most of the time when I didn't have to haul the ring. Uh, I was around JJ. And then, you know, just other guys, you know, Ricky Romero, uh, Alex Perez, the old Alex yeah, Perez, yeah. Uh, uh, Ted Heath, you know, just guys just every night. And it was just every night. And I was in there refereeing all the matches. And then it got to where I'd wrestle the first match and then referee all the rest. And, you know, that's just how I learned it. Did it over the course of, I would say it's probably about a two year deal before I. Well, see, fans out there to understand, like, being a referee and, and having all those finishes and things, doing timing, spots, and everything, that must have been a fantastic tutorial about oh, the yeah. business, watching yeah. these great wrestlers. Yeah, and especially with them in the ring, you know, he, you know like Murdoch and JJ could call everything, you know, right off. Sure. So, you know, seeing them ad-lib and take care of things when it didn't go to, go to plan, you know, I learned from that, too. Yeah, yeah. It's, I, 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 before I became a heel, uh, in ECW, I would think to my, I would always thought to myself that being a heel is just the opposite of being a babyface. And then I realized, wait, well, I got to call the match, I got to think for him and for me. And there were so many more facets to it that the, the mountain of respect I had for guys like Bobby Eaton and uh, Ted DiBiase and Eddie Gilbert and your dad and Bruno Dominic, I mean, it's a long list of people. And then you start, when you realize how much there is to do, do as a heel, and you begin to realize like how 
first of all, how fortunate he was a baby face. Like, you were getting paid to play Simon Says pretty much. Yeah. Uh, but then going back and looking and seeing like how each of these guys had completely different styles. Like, you know, Bobby never same match two nights in a row, called him on the spot. And thinking to myself, like how how easily they're finding it. You know, like, it's just right there, this boop, 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 boop. Uh, was there ever a time in the business, not, not that you got nervous, uh, you know, we reached past that point, I guess, in the butterflies, but was there ever a point that you saw yourself still, say, a third quarter of the way up the, up the ladder and all these amazing wrestlers above you? Did it ever seem to you to be, uh, like, there's no way I'll ever be better than Harley Race. There's no way I'll ever be able to take Blackjack spot. Was, did that ever hit you? No, you know, I never looked at it like that. I looked at it every night when I went out there. I always tried to have the best match that I could with who I was working with and and to try to learn something. Sure. And, and you know, I just I kept that philosophy all the way through my career, and it, and it, it really helped. Yeah. Do you still find yourself, like, towards the end of your career, that you were still learning? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's amazing, right? Yeah. Uh, how many days? I just watched a documentary the other night, 350 days. And, you know, I was half asleep of watching it, but I knew the story. Right? I had to wait to listen to what they were saying. I knew the story. Uh, and in that, like Steve Austin and I had talked on his podcast about how how overwhelming it was at first. And then after like a five, six, seven year period of this constant on the road, in the cars, dressing rooms ring with these guys that were all future Hall of Famers. Uh, all you had to do really was like Dominic taught me back at his school, keep my mouth shut and my eyes and ears open. And I was also keenly aware of what I didn't know. Yeah. Like I, and every one of these guys in this dressing room were all amazing at what they did. Uh, how how long when you were in the business, uh, or were you in the business, before you started feeling like in control? Uh, uh, not that you had mastered it, but that you wouldn't panic when something went wrong. I would say probably, I was probably three or four years into the business after I'd been working in Florida probably two years. Yeah. Now with Eddie Graham, I've, I never had the privilege of meeting him or working for him, but I've never heard anything but great things about his mind for the business. Yeah. Yeah. It was just, you know, he, he would, he would find something to talk about and he would, he would make sure that that was ingrained in your mind. Yeah. And, you know, we just, like I said, you know, we spent hours and hours and, and there were, you know, two or three flights a week sometimes when we would do that. So just it was sit, a great learning experience. Yeah, just sit under the learning tree. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now, all these guys, obviously, different personalities, different ways of, of, of leading or managing or, or running promotion. My first break in the business was the UWF with Bill Watts. Uh, luckily for me, I guess, at the time, he was off trying to build the company WWF. So Eddie was pretty much running everything, and that's who gave me my break into the business. My first time in the building with Bill, uh, I had first match in Tulsa TV taping with Eddie. He, of course, called everything. And I came back and I was excited just because it was the first time I was working as part of the crew with a real promotion. And I'm taking my tape off. Not that I even knew what a good or bad match was at that point, but it felt like a good match, and I figured Eddie calling it. Well, I walked through the curtain. I had not yet at this point met Bill. He yeah. had been off on the road. So I see him standing, you know, first curtain, second curtain, dressing room to the right. That cowboy hat and leaning on, on one, one side, and he didn't look happy. So as I got close to him, having not met him, I said, how you doing, uh, Bill? And I went to walk past him, and he said in a very loud voice, as you know, uh, what the fuck was that? And I stopped dead in my tracks, and like my brain's going to the computer, right? Is he shooting? Is he working me? And I settled on, he's working me, because it's my first night meeting him. And I turned to my cracked the grid. I was going to say, nice rib. I didn't get a syllable. He came in like a grizzly bear. And Bill, at that time, I was 205. He's, what, 340, 50. Uh, slamming into the wall and screaming at the top of his lungs. I honestly thought he was going to say, get your bag and get the fuck out. And, uh, but I, it's a tattoo on my brain. Don't ever turn your fucking back to the camera. If you turn your fucking back to the camera, the people at home don't see, which means I don't sell fucking tickets, which means you don't make fucking money. And I got it. I, I didn't like the way he did it, but I got it. Yeah. And uh, was Eddie, because uh, I've heard people talk about how Bill learned from Eddie. Uh, 
were there similar similarities between Eddie and Bill like that, or was I never saw Eddie get mad like that? Yeah, but you know, he always had an opinion about sure. a match, yeah. and, it, and it was always you know it always made sense. Too. Right, right, absolutely. And see, that's the thing that I think, and throw, throw my soapbox in there for a second, where I think the business has gone off the rails. As a kid, I was glued every time you or Funk or Eddie or somebody was in the ring. You know, watch the hell, get a free ticket to watch this great stuff. Uh, what always struck me was how everything fit together like a puzzle. Everything made sense. The kids today, my, my jaw drops with their athleticism. But I see very little, if any, of that A leads to B leads to C and it fits like a glove. It's just yeah. a smaz of, of, of moves. They're just spot fests, and, and they they don't really tell a story. Right, right. So at this point, you come into the business, and, and obviously the different names. The part I don't know is uh, exactly when I learned that you were Blackjack son, because Mulligan, Barry Wyndham. Uh, was that something the company consciously kept kayfabe, or you know what was the, what was the idea for the different names? Uh. I think just because I was just basically starting out, and uh, you know, we didn't want to tarnish my old man's yeah, name. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. Some skinny, skinny punk. <laughs> but uh, but you know, I I didn't really want to be blackjack anyway. So, right. you know, that's kind of why I used my own name. Uh, and uh, when I went up to the Carolinas and used his name, I I had had a wreck with Manny Fernandez, and uh, he came down there in Florida and got me, brought me home. And then uh, dyed my hair black and made me Blackjack Mulligan Jr. for a year and a half. Yeah, I remember reading about that. Uh, <laughs> and did you guys do a lot of tagging then? or? Yeah, we were in a lot of tags. So that, how, I mean, that's got to be, you know, and I, again, I know his father, like, there's going to be the, you know, the, the, the dad leaning on you type of thing and disciplining you. But how cool was that to be, if the career you chose wasn't thrown on you, walking to the ring with your dad? Well, it, it was it was really easy, you know. I, I had him as my partner, you know, and and everybody knew what to expect from him, you know. I was just, yeah. you know, just the guesswork thrown out there. So yeah. I really had an easy part. All I had to do was just make sure that, you know, I shined a little bit. Yeah, you didn't screw it up, right? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I wouldn't want to come into the dressing room with blackjack being upset about a missed spot or something. <laughs> yeah. The when I first broke into the business, months into the business, Dominic Gucci was my trainer, Mick Foley's, uh, took us to Montreal. And I had this chance meeting with Bill and Scott Irwin. They were up there doing some TV. And Dominic was taking us to get experience, of course. And I, Bill had left the room, and I'm watching Scott lace those, you know, those real high boots up. And I said to Scott, I said, how, how did you and Bill come up with this gimmick? And he looked at me, he looked at said, so I don't know, if we weren't harassed, but we'd be in a bar or stomping a mud on somebody right now. <laughs> and then he gave me, honest to God, the best advice of my career as far as character development goes. He said, don't try to do anything original. It's all been done. And he went down like mummies and Frankenstein's monsters and cowboys and Indians and goes the whole thing. And then he said, look for wrestlers that wrestle in your vein that you admire. Take a little piece from each of them, throw it in a blender, and then he said to throw it big heaping dose of yourself on top. Well, those people for me were you, Brad, Steamboat, Flair, Funk, and obviously Bruno and Dominic, uh, and then a big dose of myself on there. Yeah. Your shelling as a baby face, uh, Steamboat fantastic at it. Uh, Ricky Morton, phenomenal. I mean, there's some guys that are really good at it. I have you at like that upper echelon of the selling where that is really what's selling for the heel heel over, getting the match over, and bringing the fans into it. Well, it makes the job easier for the heel, too. Yeah, absolutely. The pain face itself. Yeah. Okay, it makes it yeah, that sure work. Sure. Was there anybody that influenced you on that? Anybody that came in and said, hey, kid, like, maybe try this instead of that? Well, when I first started out, you know, I was, I, you know, I was never a jobber, but but I mean, they beat me and they beat me on TV, but it's what it did is it was building up to something where I finally got that win on TV. Right. And then I started progressing and I did a program with uh, Morocco to where we went for the TV title. And I went Broadway, Broadway, Broadway with him. So, I mean, it was just, 
just a different way of building a, a, a character. Right. Uh, Again, because you're selling to me, like, it, I always looked at wrestling, having wrestled amateur when I was younger. Uh, I would always watch a rest, professional wrestling. I loved it. Uh, what, to me, did I like about it? What did I dislike about it? And to me, the, the whole Kate Fade thing and building up the characters, once I got older, I realized what those things were. Uh, and then I would go back and watch those matches because I had a mountain of tapes in my house. And I would watch these matches, and every time I would watch somebody like you or Eddie Gilbert, I would see something different, something in addition to what I picked up before. Uh, for you, when you would get in the ring of the babyface and sell it, uh, or firing for the comeback, was it something that you just let come through naturally, or did you really ponder it? Did you really dig into it? Well, selling, you know, was just, you know, I was just taught to sell as babyface. Uh, what you're trying to do is you're trying to think a real fight. You're trying to work a real fight. So that's what you got to put in your mind is that, you know, this is a real fight, so you would react like a real fight. You know? and, and that just got driven into my mind. Uh, so, so that's how I learned to sell. And then as far as making comebacks, you know, Eddie Graham, he, he said, shit on the ring lights if you can, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. He called me the screaming skeleton. <laughs> he said, just, he said, just go fucking crazy stomp to the mat. Yeah. Shit on the ring lights. <laughs> that's, and that's reflected in that picture I told you about, yeah. right? It's, uh, the, you know, for the kids again out there watching and listening and understand, trying to understand, I hope, uh, the way, like for me, it was so intimidating walking into those dressing rooms, right? I mean, all these guys are the guys I've been watching for years. And, and again, you, you walked into that room and you were immediately aware of what you didn't know. Uh, and then appreciative after the match at how these guys were taking by the nose and pulling you through. Uh, you mentioned something earlier about the, you know, think it's a real fight. Bill Watts had a saying, think, shoot, but work. Yeah. And, and, and I, I was always doing that through my head. Uh, it's where the, where the K fame has gone in the business. Uh, and, you know, I understand how everything has been exposed and all that, of course. But I like it to, when I go into a movie theater, I'll use the, I use the same movie all the time, Halloween, when Halloween first came out. I remember vividly, like it was yesterday, my friend and I going to watch that movie, and we had seen a thousand <laughs> spook movies, scary movies, monster movies, whatever. And when the, he gets the knitting needle in the neck, and you think he's dead, and he sits up behind. Now, rewind to the beginning of that movie. If, if John Carpenter, who wrote and directed that movie, had come on that screen, 50 foot tall, right before the movie starts, and said, oh, John Carpenter, the writer, director, appreciate you buying a ticket to come see my movie. I want you to know that all the blood you're seeing is just K-Ro syrup with red food diet. And nobody's dying, and the knives are all rubber. Enjoy the movie. That would have made it a comedy instead of like, oh my God, right? That sort of dig into the cell. Yeah. And, and to me, that's kayfabe, right? Like if, if, we're, if you and I are working a program for a year building up this, you keep beating the shit out of me and screwing me however you can, and we have a big show on the pay-per-view next week, and then the week leading up to that, like WWE Experience or AEW Dark, right? Uh, where they go on immediately after the show and then they sort of make fun of what they just did on the show. Mm. And you see, like with WrestleMania experience, again, you and I have been spending a year building this angle and the company with their time and money. And then three days before WrestleMania, there's man, you having a beer together in, in tuxedos. Yeah. And I just cannot fathom why they do that. Again, it would be like John Carpenter coming up on the screen and saying what I, I said earlier. Uh, it just completely has the floor drop out from everything you and I have worked our asses on for. Yeah. And the company's put all that time and effort into. Do you see the same thing in the business uh, from a different perspective, same the same way? Well, you know, it's like I was saying before, you know, I just see spot fest matches. Guys that, I guess there's so many different little wrestling schools around, you know, that, that everybody, they think if they can hit the ropes and take a bump that they should be a wrestler. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's, there's more to it. it. It's a trade that you've got to learn that if you want to be good, then you've got to spend time. Sure. And you've got to, and there's a lot of thought process that goes into it, you know, besides being all physical. Yeah. And, 
You know, that's just that's just the way I was taught. Same, yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, it's stark to me whenever I watch the difference because I hear coming on the road driving with these guys and stuff and I start to talk about this and I think to myself, where did it go off the rails? Like how if you were a young kid in this dressing room and saw a Barry Wyndham sitting here or Arn Anderson or Tully Blanche or Jake Roberts, you have no questions for these guys. There's not a thing these guys could give you to help teach you. And I, I always say, if I was coming in the NFL, number one draft choice quarterback, I come in, I think I'm full of shit and vinegar, right? And there's Tom Brady standing over there, and Ben Roethlisberger, or Terry Bradshaw. I'm guessing I probably have a question or two for them. Uh, I had gone to a couple of the AEW shows, and I, before the, right before the show had started, I ran into Arn and sat and spoke to Arn for probably 30 minutes. And during that time, about a single kid came up to talk to them and ask them anything. And I thought to myself, I know these kids are all aware of what he was in the business and how good he was. How can that, it just doesn't make sense to me. You've got this fountain of knowledge over here. Why would you not partake from that? I, I don't know why uh, uh, the AEW doesn't have a, a position for Arn, you know, to be like that. But, you know, he's told me, he says, I'm just there. He says, they don't ask me anything, I don't do anything. He says, just tell me what to do and I do right. it. Right. And you and I both had the, the privilege of working with him. And what a night off it was, but how much you, every night, in my feeling anyway, it was every night I worked with somebody like Arn Anderson. I went back to that dressing room possessing more knowledge than I did before I went to that ring. Yeah. And it was a night to night basis. How far in the, like, at what point of your credit, it was 79 you broke in, right? Yeah. Okay, so how long during this time we talked about the running up and down the roads uh, before they started nudging you up that card a little bit? Or, and, and, and were you even aware of it they were starting to nudge you up a bit? Well, I was with Dusty in Florida, and, and I traveled with Dusty, and I was pretty close to him, you know, and... Uh, we talked a lot, you know, and we talked a lot about the angles and all that, and about what he was doing and what we were going to do. Uh, I just think that's how it came about, you know, just being around Dusty. Right, right. Now, Dusty, I had never seen that side. He was always the, the booker in the office when I, you know, when I came in as a kid. Yeah. Uh, what was his teaching style? Like when he would talk, if you went out there and did something really dumb in the ring, would he come to you hot? Would he? Uh, more kid love it. How how did he handle that with the young guy, the young timers? I never really really seen him call anybody down for anything they did in the ring. I've seen him mad a couple of times, you know, but it was just over something that happened during the match with him or whoever he was with. Uh, yeah, I, I never saw him handle anybody that way. Yeah, yeah. He I, I saw him one time, and uh, this is during the time when the NWA had bought the EWF out. We, you know, what they call the, uh, the, the massacre in uh, New Orleans, uh, UNO. And uh, he walked in to the dressing room. And all the guys had gotten together earlier that day, and there was a deal in place that we're all, everyone that wanted to go to Memphis could go to Memphis. And so Eddie goes and gets Dusty, right? And Dusty comes out. And I mean, it just, it sticks in my brain because it shows you how masterful he was at this. He, about 15 minutes later, Eddie comes to the door, and Bill, uh, uh, Dusty walks in and stop, takes one step in the door and looks around and goes, Eddie, can I talk to you for a minute? <laughs> Turn and walk back out, right? And they're gone about 20 minutes and Eddie came back and said, we're, we're working tonight. So later that night, uh, Dusty called us in for a meeting and he had a piece of paper folded in half and what looked like half a circle. He said, who can tell what's on this paper? Everybody's making their guess, right? it's a ball, it's a this, it's a that. And, and nobody got it right, of course, and he opens it up. It's an Easter egg. And he said, always remember, only the booker has all the pieces in his head. And I remember just like, man, like how that just like hit me, right? Like we're all bitching because we're doing a job or a short match or not on the card tonight. And then as a kid that doesn't yet know anything, and the booker comes in and shows you that. And I'm like, okay, I'm gonna start learning to keep my mouth shut and just yeah. pay attention, right? Uh, the, uh, so like, your time in Florida, how long were you in Florida at this point? Let's see, wrestling not. probably, well, up until 85, I went to New York, and then I was back there in 86, 87. It's 
So I spent almost, oh, well, probably six, seven years working yeah. in Florida. And during that time in Florida, again, because I never had a chance to work there, <laughs> was it a every, every town each week? Was it a weekly territory? Yeah, yeah, it was. And, and uh, what were the furthest drives on that? Did you guys ever leave? Three hundred and fifty miles was the farthest. That was Tallahassee. Whenever it was run, mm. so you guys were home pretty much every night. Yeah, every yeah. night. Those territories were great, aren't they? Like, yeah, you work your ass off, and you're in your own bed every night. Yeah, and you can make decent money. Yes, yeah, and not blow it all uh, on on the ring. I hear uh, again my experience. Uh, my my experience with Florida Championship Wrestling is that what I read and what I've come to learn in these talks with people. But I've got a ton of friends in Florida, and when they talk about Florida Championship Wrestling and Eddie Graham and, and you know the, the uh, what was the name of the building in uh, the Armory in uh, uh, Tampa, Tampa Armory, Tampa, Tampa Armory, yes, and they talk about it with a, a gleam in their eye, like this was something different, something magical, uh, and, and all of them, same thing. I, I, every Monday night I was at this building or this building on Tuesday night. Uh, and, and it's that same kind of thing like we would see in the UWF for me much later, but uh, well, a few years later. But how those fans in each of those territories were like super glued to that promotion, loved it, idolized it, mm-hmm. came and supported it constantly. Uh, with Eddie, uh, was there ever a time during that? Because with time, we all do this, right? The, the, the catfish we caught two years ago was this big, but now it's this big, you know. It, was there any of that before the championship wrestling? Uh, because everything I've ever heard about it is with glowing praise. Was there ever a bad time or a time when stuff just wasn't clicking? Not in the time I was there. I mean, you know, it was always, you know, fairly consistent, you know, with the money and and towns were easy, trips were easy. It was, it was really an easy territory. And did any of this entire time that you were there, was Eddie always the booker, or did he ever step back? Well, Eddie, Eddie was never the booker when I was there. Dusty oh, really? was, uh, Bob Root, J.J. Dillon. Let's see, might might have been somebody else there I worked for. But yeah, that's I think that's about it. Well, I I always had the assumption that that he was the, all, Dusty and all these guys, Mike and everybody was working under him, but he was the booker. No. He, wow. he let the bookers do their job and use their guys. You know, he just, he always went and, you know, he just gave his opinion on everything. Sure. And, and I'm guessing that when he gave his opinion, people listened. Yeah. And because oh, yeah. It's, again, Bill, Eddie's one of those guys I've never met. But in all my years in the business, I've never heard anybody say anything negative about him as a boss or a promoter. Yeah. And uh, it must have been a lot of fun, I, I, you know, as a kid coming up in the business. Yeah, it was. I have great memories down there. My first years in the business, it was, it was crazy. Yeah, no snowfall, no. <laughs> a little bit of rain here and there. My first Christmas there, it was 85 degrees. <laughs> Used to a little bit colder than that. Yeah, and I had been out in Canyon, Texas, where it was minus 20 on Christmas <laughs> the year before. Yeah, right. It's uh, Were you in uh, Florida Championship Wrestling when Dominic Tanucci came through there? No. He, he would, you know, he had before he passed away, we would always have hours and hours of talks. And he would often talk about Florida and, and really put Eddie over. And same type of thing you're saying, how easy the territory was as far as travel, uh, how he was able to do what he wanted to do, uh, and how he felt really freed up as, as, a, as a talent, not just being told to go to the ring and do A, B, and C, and then wait for D, and, you know, whatever. Yeah. Uh, and, and I always like to ask that question about Dominic because he was... I had a great father, uh, adored my father, uh, but he had died in 93, and Dominic, for 20 years prior to that, was sort of like a code dad to me. And you know, when my dad was gone, so I, saw I sort of had a father figure around. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the business and the, and the way it's changed, like from the territory system that like you were part of, I dabbled in that a tiny bit. There was still uh, uh, UWF, Memphis, Portland, uh, you know, there were still a handful of these territories around. But by that time, you could, looking back, you could clearly see that next year this one wouldn't be here, next year that one wouldn't be here. Yeah. Was that a, uh, again, I was just a kid coming into the business and none of this stuff, but 
was how aware was the talent in all of these territories that this behemoth called WWF is swallowing everything up and stepping forward and crushing everybody? Well, I was in Charlotte when, uh, well, I guess it was in Florida when, he, when Vincent first bought uh, from his dad and it started up. But uh, I don't think that there were really guys, you know, just the end of the territory era. You know, like there in Charlotte, we had an un unbelievable crew. You know, Orndorff, Paul Jones, yeah. Mr. Wrestler number two, and Tim Woods. I mean, incredible talent. Yeah. yeah. And then Georgia, too, with Jim Hurd, right down the road, also had a great crew, right? Yeah. And so there was all these places that were still festering with the talent, uh, festering loaded with talent. Uh, at what point did it? They start to become aware that if we're going to survive, these two companies are going to have to join up, and these three companies are going to have to do something. Did that ever become like a, an open discussion in dressing rooms or in the, on the road? Uh, I wouldn't say in, in, the, in the dress rooms, but you know, I know Crockett, you know, when he was, you know, Vince was already buying or, or squashing territories and taking everybody. That's when Crockett decided to buy UWF and, and do that. Uh, it was, it was an odd time in the business, I'll say that for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Even as a kid, I felt that. Yeah. Man, it just felt really quirky. Uh, Jim Barnett, uh, how, at what point in your career did you finally have interaction with Jim Barnett? You know, I, I really didn't have too much interaction with Jim Barnett. Uh, I met him a few times, but, but uh, I just never really had any. He, to, when I first met him in UWF, Dominic had worked for him as, as, as his top guy in uh, AWA in Australia a decade or a decade and a half before. When I first met him and I went there, Dominic said, make sure you introduce yourself. And, uh, you know, of course, you know, Jimsy and I, I respected the world out of him, but, you know, everybody in the business does a Jimsy imitation, right? Uh, he was such an oddball person. That, you know, for, as a kid, again, there's sort of this distance. But he took me to his office and we sat down to talk. And I'm looking at the pictures he has on his wall. And I see him on the Carter inauguration stand, sitting two or three seats behind Carter. And on the Reagan inauguration. And I'm looking at these pictures of him. Who is this guy? Like, man, he, he must be somebody, right? If you're sitting that close to the president's. Uh, he had a, an amazing... Uh, finger on the pulse of the psychology. That was where I, I believe, at least from what Dominic had told me, where that really became a big thing in the business because he had been, uh, before the Australia promotion, he had been a professor of psychology at the University of Chicago. Really? Yeah, and so, you know, when you're talking to him, like, I didn't know that when I first met him, and I just thought he was like one of the guys that helps out in the office or whatever. And then you come to find out that, and then you go back and see the little footage that you can see from AWA in Australia, but then also in, in all the territories, once those companies, once the territories started folding down, those companies that didn't survive started growing, and you saw the greats in those companies all exhibiting that psychology. Yeah. It, there was a story being told that made perfect sense. Yeah. And I think that came from Jim. Are you aware? I know Eddie was a great guy with psychology. Uh, who else like, were you aware of in the business at that time that were working in or out of these territories were... Uh, to me, it's like Jim Barnett, uh, Eddie Graham, even though I never met Bill Watts. Those are the guys I think of promoters that, that were heavy on the psychology. Was there anybody else that you were aware of that you worked for or that didn't quite, their name quite last in the business? The only guy that I really spent any time around like that was Eddie. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like that was my, you know, my first six years in the business I was around him. So, right. you know, that, that probably... That ate up a good portion of that. Sure. Uh, I think with my dad being who he was, you know, a lot of guys kind of shied away from giving me. Yeah. I don't want to thank him by Jim. Yeah. <laughs> when, once you start making this climb, man, you know, every, I always tell my son who's a guitarist, Eric Clapton screws up every night on the stage. He's just so good at can make you think he wanted to do that. Uh, Every night we, we, make, we all make mistakes in the ring. 
was there ever a time as you were starting to get like now with that semi main and inching towards the main event stuff, uh, and your name is building around the industry worldwide? Was there ever a time your dad came to you and tried to give you pointers, or, or was he pretty much hands off? Yeah, he was pretty hands off. You know, wow. like I said, the only advice he really gave me was to snug up. Mm. See, that, that, that seems crazy to me because it's, you know, as a father, I can't imagine if my kids were following my footsteps that I would be able to push that urge down, like to give them some kind of piece of advice or whatever. Do you, do you take that now in the hindsight looking back, knowing your dad? Was that sort of your dad's validation saying, do a great job, kid, by not sticking his nose in? Uh... Probably, you know, he, he knew that I had, you know, other teachers, you know, Dusty and, and Murdoch, and I was around all those guys, and he probably see it, saw it in the way that I worked, too. Yeah, yeah. You know, you can watch somebody work, and you can kind of pick up who they've learned from. Oh, absolutely. And, uh, you know, I'm sure he saw that, and he was okay with it. Yeah, yeah. And, and of course, he had, had worked with all these guys, and yeah. knew what they were capable of. Uh, the fraternity of the business uh, is something I always ask guys like you. I had come into the business again, snotting those kids not knowing anything. And hearing stories from Dominic and Bruno and later Funk and guys talking about this fraternity, we jumped in the car and we're gonna make this loop this week. Um, how tight those guys became making those loops together, looking out for each other, that kind of thing. When the business finally exploded into the national and then international way that it did, and that sort of disappeared, at least in, in my opinion, was that something that, like, were you aware of that coming up? Did you experience that kind of camaraderie amongst the boys? Yeah, well, when I first traveled, I traveled with the guys, you know, every day. And you know, I traveled with Gordon Nelson and, you know, the referees and the first match guys, you know, Reggie Parks. Uh, yeah, yeah. I traveled with all those guys for about the first year. But uh, then, you know, it's just, I don't know, it, the way the business changed, I guess it was all the flights and everything when you first started flying, yeah. you know, everybody wants to do their own thing. And I don't know, I just saw a change, you know, there's not as much communication between the guys, not as much, I guess the guys are just as friendly as they used to be. Yeah. But, uh, you know, because that's the nature of the business. But, uh, yeah, all that time on the road was definitely something that was, it was different traveling with all the guys. Sure. And all that time, in my experience, you were learning something yeah. on those eight, nine, ten hour trips. Uh, once it became that, and, and to the point you bring up about the flights and, and everything, I did experience that, where it became from driving, 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 now drive, flight, 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 drive. Uh, and you, know, you have to go on the road with these you know, huge bags of stuff because you've been gone so long. How much, did, uh, 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 I guess let's go back, what year did you get married? Uh, 92. Okay. And your wife, obviously, by this point, knows your career, yeah. knows how, how often you're on the road and everything. Mm -hmm. uh, once it started becoming this 350 days and flights halfway around the world and everything, and always gone from home, uh, how long did it take before, after that happened that uh, that became a, Albatross around the marriage. I think me being home too much is what ruined my marriage. Is that right? <laughs> really? <laughs> no, no, she just changed her mind. So yeah. I was, yeah, she was fine with it. I mean, you know, we had a nice home and everything that she could want. It's just, you know, she just had different values than I had. Yeah. yeah. And, and I mean, to be fair, it is hard, right? I mean, the yeah. husband's gone all those days every year and, and those honey do lists keep, keep building up and you're never there. To, to cut through them. Uh, Kendall, what year did Kendall start breaking into the business? I'm sure it was 85, maybe 86. Yeah, I, re I recall his name, uh, again, still at that point, wasn't able to see him. But I remember hearing his name, you know, as kids are always getting arrested in the magazines and see if anybody mentioned or whatever. And I remember seeing his name coming up, and, and when I saw him, the, the the visual view to him, unlike you to Blackjack at that time, that 
I was, you know, it was, I was pretty damn sure you guys were brothers. Yeah. And you know, so it was, it was again drawn to watching his career as I'm coming into the business and, and watching his work. Uh, did your dad have any input there with Kendall? Uh, did, because I see a lot of similar similarities between you guys, but I see not quite as extensively in him as I saw in like the selling and the buyer. Yeah, that stuff that became your hallmark. Well, I, I you know, he didn't get the uh, the lessons from Eddie that I got in the talks. Mm -hmm. And I think he was just kind of more or less just thrown into it. I, I don't know how he trained, you know, because yeah. I was around him. I was on the road. And, yeah. He was a mild man, so I don't know how he trained to, to start. But when he came to Florida, you know, he started off, uh, you know, probably two or three times a week and then went full time. Nice. But uh, he was a real light bloomer. You know, he's 320 pounds now. He's a huge wow. guy. He's a monster. Yeah. But uh, you know, <laughs> them jeans coming out. Yeah. 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 He's as big as my old man was. Is that right? Yeah. Now I had read that uh, Harley Race was instrumental in the training. Uh, yeah. Well, that was really in ring training. Working. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I never had the privilege of working with him other than Royal Rumble. Uh, I can only imagine it must have been just a phenomenal experience. Well, the first time I wrestled him, I think it was in the Highlight uh, Auditorium in Ocala, Florida. And uh, Dusty wanted us to go through an hour. Had you ever done an hour that way? No. So you're shitting bricks right now. Yeah. I mean, I'd probably only been in the business. I've probably only been working there in Florida three or four months. Oh my God! Yeah. <laughs> so we get in there, and Harley, of course, you know, as a reference check, this is giving us the first spot. He goes a headlock takeover. And I said, Mr. Race, I've never done a headlock takeover. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit! <laughs> Fucking dream! Oh my God! <laughs> We did probably <laughs> 50, maybe 100 headlock takeovers yeah. in that match. We did it, and we went 58 minutes, and he, he finally he just pinned me. Yeah, and the crowd with it the whole way. Oh, yeah, they were yeah. with it. Were you as amazed that I was, like, coming into business again? I, to me, it was always a chore. I couldn't just go to the ring and have a good match. I had to really, really think it through. But I would watch guys like Harley or Dusty or, or uh, Steamboat, Murdoch, Slater, all these guys that would go to the ring and could literally manipulate the audience. Uh, it's like a magic trick. Yeah. You know, they, if, uh, I'd stay on the apron, and you, you worked with us several times, and I was a team with Ricky. And there's times you'll see him take a bump and he'll cover his face like this, and he's yelling to me to get in the match because I'm like this. <laughs> I'm like a fan watching, oh, he's supposed to be working out here. Uh, but he would literally be able to, if he wanted that corner of the building to pop, nobody else he could get that corner to pop and we would talk about it in the car and he would try to explain it it was like like way above my head i couldn't get it like it, 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 again like cutting the lady in half or something who were the guys that you worked with at that time uh that like harley you get into with harley because i again for you fans to try to get some some context to this months in the business and being told you're going out to do an hour with some of the Hardy race. Yeah. Yeah, and there's a pretty big cinder block someplace, isn't there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And when you came back, had you forgotten all that stress and everything and had a good time, didn't you? Yeah, and it was an easy hour, too. It was yeah. easy going with him. I think I went and got in the sauna afterwards. Yeah, yeah. He was, again, one of those guys that I couldn't see until much later in my time as a fan. But... He mesmerized me when I watched him. Hey, he didn't look like a wrestler, right? It was the skinny legs and that beer belly. And, but my God, would he get in the ring again? Like I said earlier, the, the guys you can't take your eyes off of. And anytime he was on the screen, I could not take my eyes off him. Yeah. It was just an amazing watching him. Yeah. Harley was a really gifted performer. Yes. I, I say he's one of the best. Probably the best. Yeah, he was. He, yeah, I, I would concur with that. I thought he was a really special talent. So now we, we get to the point thereabouts where you're getting ready to go to the WWF with uh, Mike. 
what was the, were you guys hesitant to go? Uh, was there any, like, well, I'm not quite sure. Well, we were, we had gone from uh, Florida to the Carolinas. I, you know, to, to start the thing with uh, Crockett. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was there three or four months and I got like three checks in a row that were under a hundred dollars. Wow. You know, like, and road warriors were getting, you know, that they had just signed a $750,000 contract. So I'm sitting in the dress room and, you know, I just think, oh, hundred bucks. Right. I didn't have enough time, money to get to the next town, I think right. it was. Right. And uh, I called my old man and I told him, and I said, uh, I said, can you still talk to George Scott? He says, yeah, I've got his number right here. So he called him and George said, we'll start tomorrow if you want. And now, back to, before we get to WWF, when you and Mike were working here, making this hundred bucks a week, you guys were working in a fairly substantial spot, right? Yeah, well, Rotunda was still there. I went on up to, to WWE. Oh, you guys didn't go together? No, I was there for probably four or five months before he came. And I convinced, you know, I said, Vince, I said, we really got to get Mike up here. And he was all for it. We brought him up there and, and put us with uh, with uh, Nikki and uh, Sheik. And we were off and, off and going. Yeah, we were ready to go. Uh, I, I spoke about when you said those names. Uh, I want to go back to Florida for a second. Uh, and, and your experiences working with Kevin Sullivan. Uh, first of all, in, in that time frame, uh, that devil gimmick that you're evil and all you know those promos and everything were there any towns where uh going into those towns like where kevin would have to be you know we're in the middle of the bible belt in some of those places uh were there ever a time when fans took that a little too liberal you know i don't know uh you know, we were always all in the same dressing room, you know, at the TVs and never really talked about it. So I never really heard him mention anything about it. But, uh, you know, like my father, you know, he got stabbed in, yes. in the uh, Boston Garden. He got st stabbed out of the leg, 200 or 320 stitches in his leg, 150 in his arm and some down oh. his back. But, I think because Dusty was there, you know, people watched it, they knew it was entertainment, mm -hmm. but, you know, they wanted to believe it. But I don't think they went that extra mile. So you said something a second ago that surprised me. Uh, when I was coming to visit UWF and then Continental, uh, and I think even maybe the NWA in those first couple of years, the dress rooms were kayfabe. The hotels were kayfabe, the flights were kayfabe. Yeah. Uh, so as a young guy that didn't know squat, that, I think, lent more to my butterflies and stress than anything did because there was no chance to talk yeah. or to set anything up. You might be able to, one night a week, tell a ref, hey, Tommy Young, take this spot over or whatever, but that was rare. Uh, so in Florida was not, there were, there were not KFA dressing rooms. Well, there were, yeah, just at, just the TV at the, oh, okay. at the little uh, sportatorium where we filmed our TVs. Gotcha. Everybody was all together. In comparison to 10th and Techwood, in, uh, which is where NWA, WCW would later film their Saturday Night 605 show. And in relation to that, how was this TV building in Florida? Was it bigger? A lot smaller. A yeah. lot smaller? Yeah, a lot well, smaller. How did they fit the ring in there? Well, the, the ring just fit, and then they just had, they had a few people on some stands on the back side. Yeah. And then they had cameras here, and then the set was back over on the, you know, back this way if the ring was there. Right. Where it was really a small set. Where did you guys dress? In the uh, offices of whoever worked there. Yeah, yeah. Whoever was dumb enough to leave their door <laughs> yeah, on yeah, the right. Friday before. Because <laughs> Tenth and Techwood, the only thing I liked about Tenth and Techwood was that it was air conditioned. Yeah. Right? But it, we, we dressed literally, all of us, in a corner of the room behind that curtain, which was about, what, 10 feet from David's podium? Yeah. Uh, but boy, a lot of, a lot of good memories there. Uh, in those uh, buildings like that, like for me, especially early on, it always seemed a bit, uh, sort of what I use, uh, a little bit too generic. Uh, uh, maybe that's the right word. Wrestling, I was so used to watching wrestling with these massive crowds. More like studio wrestling. Yeah, the studio yeah. stuff. 
Uh, did you find it harder to work in those types of books because there was so little of that fan interaction? Well, that little building had, we had probably 200 people in there, but they all screamed and yeah. they worked for it. And that building was hot yeah. and sweaty. Uh, it was just a great place to learn. You know, right. It was just, everybody was into it and it was easy. I remember it being like probably 120 degrees in there. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was Sullivan and we got to go 45 minutes. And we're both sweating our balls on <laughs> Now, in that kind of, uh, you know, smaller territory like that, but going good business, after a TV table, with somebody like Eddie or Dusty, whoever was booking at the time, would they sit you guys down and next week let's try this or stop doing that? Was there any kind of team meetings at that time? No, no. Just sometimes, you know, before before the TV, he might you know talk to a few guys, but because you know then you only have one or two angles going, you can concentrate on your angles and your rest are or just enhancement matches and stuff right. like that. It was. You know, it wasn't it wasn't hard, but because it was a small territory and everything was so close together, you know, you had to right. took a lot of thinking to get your finishes and everything right. Where you did the same thing in towns twenty miles apart, yeah. and not duplicate yeah. something earlier or whatever. Uh, exactly. With uh, again, that just you know lends to the uh, Eddie Graham legend to me because uh, hey, it's it's conducive, right? We have all the boys right here. We just had a taping. If we need to have a team meeting, I guess they would say today. Uh, but that tells me that he trusted his talent and he trusted his bookers and uh, and, and didn't overly interject. Am I correct in that? Yeah, well, I mean, it was a different time in the business too. You know, there wasn't, everything wasn't micromanaged like it is now. Right. So right. if you could go out there and get yourself over in a match, it was great. If you did, next oh, guy. Yeah, yeah. So that's just how it was. Right. When, like I, I told you earlier in this, you know, my first introduction to Bill Watts. Uh, and, and look at in hindsight, when he came to the NWA later, Bill, I, I, and I caught on because I was in the business about seven, eight years at that point, where he would come in and say, you and I were working on an angle. He would come to me and say, hey, I thought you and Barry got along. Well, I, yeah, we do. He said, well, I mean, what he's saying, right? And then come to you and say, hey, I think you and Shane and Shane's any of those little games they would play, yeah. did Graham play those type of games or those little, you know, just mental games to try to keep it a little bit discombobulated? No, not at all. I mean, we all worked hard. It was an easy territory, so there yeah. wasn't any of that stuff going on. Yeah. Again, brilliant, right? Because yeah. that's the kind of stuff that starts to... I could see Bill doing that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <it> was, <laughs> Rick, he did that between Rick, uh, Ricky Steamboat and I were working with him and Vader. We were having great matches and loved working with them. And Rube came right to me. You know, Rube was right here. I talked to him, pulled me aside, and said, Is there a problem? <laughs> Is there a problem? Man, I love, love working with him. And he told me what Bill had said, right? And, and 20 minutes later, Bill came in and told me the exact same thing. I was like, You son of a bitch. It's, uh, <laughs> again, all those games. Uh, was Florida a, uh, a good paying territory? Well, yeah, I mean, you could make twenty five hundred to four grand a week if you were on top there. So I mean, late seventies, early eighties. Yeah, nice, yeah. good money. The uh, where or has it always been there? Uh, like for me, the thing I've always despised about the business is the politics of the business. You know, the backstabbing and uh, hey, Barry, how you doing? Yeah, I yeah, get you. Uh, had that always been around? I, I don't recall ever hearing brutal or dominant talk about that. They would talk more about the heat of the office. Uh, but I'd never heard them either of them tell me a story about this wrestler screwed over, lied to them. Uh, has that always been around or were you aware of when that interjected into the business? Well, you know, with all the personalities that there are in our business, there's always somebody that's not going to get along. Right. So uh, I just think now because, you know, it's just Everybody's so much more aware of what's going on that you hear about little spats and they might get blown up in them. Right. And things, but that's just how it is. Yeah, yeah. So let, let's jump back for it again, back to the WWF. So Mike finally comes up. Yeah. How long before they, they put you guys together? Or was it immediate? No, we were immediately put together on TV. Okay. And then you, if, if I remember correctly, was it? Uh, working with Adrian, Adrian Adonis and Murdoch. Yeah. For a while. 
that had to be incredible. Yeah. I mean, I, I had the pri privilege of working with uh, Murdoch and UWF. Never got the chance with Adrian, but as a, as one of the boys, you watch him and just see how what a special talent he was in the ring. Yeah. So, like when you get up there, how quickly? My experience in WWF was that there was a lot of micromanaging, a lot of don't do this, don't do that. Oh yeah. Uh, so for someone like you and, and Mike coming from where you came from, and that was not part of that game, uh, did you guys rebel against that? Did it take? You well, when we first got there, it, it wasn't it wasn't as bad. It wasn't micromanaged as much. We had Lanza as an as a well, agent, and well, uh, Lanza, yeah. there was Renee Goulet and. Uh, Jay Strongbow, uh, and you know those guys, they just wanted to you know, get through the night. So it was easy stuff, you know. It was just later on, events started, you know, wanting everything, to micromanage everything, the finishes, want to know what afterwards, want to know what the guys are doing in the dressing room, who's, what time they're getting there. Right. This is all kinds of bullshit. Yeah. It's so, just creating bullshit yeah. where it doesn't need to be. Yeah. Uh, for. Uh, and I'm guessing also the guys who mentioned Blackjack and Renee, uh, you know, some of those guys up there that really were, were great agents to work with. Uh, I'm sure there's also an element as you're out in the house shows and say Blackjack or Sarge or both of them are on the show. I'm guessing, and correct me if I'm wrong, that they know that Nick Mur uh, 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 Dick Murdoch, uh, uh, Adrian, you and Mike were in the ring. And they're pretty well aware that you guys know your way around the ring. Yeah. So they didn't have to worry about the micromanager. Yeah, they probably didn't even watch. Yeah, yeah. And did you find that, like, from, from coming from a, the, the kid's position in the business and learning, 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 when you got to the point where you realized the agents or the promoter was, said, okay, Mary, God, give me something good, and they just left it to you, did you find that liberating and uh, footloose? Well, I mean, that's kind of how it was for me from the start, you know, because, you know, there, there wasn't all the micromanaging. You know, you, you more or less had control of who you were and what you said and what you did, you know, and whether it worked or not. Uh, later, you know, with Vince, he started changing that, you know, dictating what characters do and all that. And it just, you know, that's when the business changed too. You know, when management had more control over what you're doing than you did. And that was a tectonic shift because I mean, it we think 79 to what was 83, 84. Mm -hmm. So you've been in the business for approaching 15 years and had a pretty solid name built. Uh, same as Mike, same as uh, Adrian and, and, and Dickie. Uh, somebody like Dick, uh, my, you know, love him to death, he, he could get a bit terse, right, when, when things were right. How did, was there ever a time that you saw somebody like Dick or Adrian? Pushing back against that micromanaging, or yeah, I can't do it that way, or well, Adonis didn't want to put us over for the, the title, mm -hmm. so Murdoch said, "I'll do it." You know, he did it for me, you know, which was you know, great. Uh, but Adonis, Adonis had a a reputation in the dressing room around that time. You know, he was always screwed up on drugs. He was just wasn't completely there at that time. So, right. how long after this? Uh, when we get into those eighties. My it just sort of all runs together to me. Uh, was I, I in my head? I have it that around that mid eighties, eighty six time frame when Adrian got killed in an accident. Right? Were you guys working with them then? No, that was afterwards. Yeah. Uh, that was a couple of years afterwards. We had worked with Murdoch and uh, Adrian in eighty. Early '85, mm. and then Murdoch finished, and Adrian went on to. I guess he was the, the guy in pink for a while. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, you know, my first experience working with Dick Murdoch, and I was like, you were just a huge fan of his. Uh, we were in Biloxi, Mississippi, and he goes to the ring first, and he's not on the microphone. He's yelling over the crowd, "Bill Watts, I want me some competition. Send me some competition." I was. 205, 210 at the time, hey, let me use that with the curtain. He starts like pointing at me and laughing, right? And I said, what's he doing that for? He goes to get up in the ring and do the old arm drag, hip toss, body slam uh, opening. We're eight, nine, ten minutes into the match and we've really done nothing. The fourth time we locked up, and it, it 
it's again one of those things that I'm tattooed on my brain. Uh, we locked up, and as he's pushing me to the turnbuckle, he says, uh, Shane, do you hear me, boy? And I said, Yes, sir. He said, I want you to duck my punch and hit me. One time. It was like that pregnant drag, right? Mm -hmm. I didn't get it at the time, but now, knowing what I know, I'm certain he thought, if I don't tell him one time, he's going to hit me 50 times, right? And, and again, the protection of that cafe, right? Yeah. Just do it one time and gets his heat, and 10 minutes later, 15 minutes later, the match, he stops and sells that punch from 10 or 15 minutes ago. And although I didn't at that point quite fully understand it, I did sort of get it. And then learning more on top of that, you it. for me, I always revisit those types of things and think, man, what a fucking master. Right? Yeah. Just, just brilliant and, and the simplicity. Uh, and all those guys in the business like that were like that. Were that. You're running WWE, you guys had a good run up there. Uh, at what point, you end up departing, or did you and Mike both leave at the same time? We left at the same time, but he went back. Yeah. And where did you go from there? Uh, I went back to Florida. Okay. So Florida was still running at this point. Yeah, 86 and 87 was in Florida. What were, when did Florida close? It was probably, it was, I would say it was probably around 90, because I think Dusty went in there after that. Yeah, probably not 90. And so you go back to Florida, uh, and Mike ends up returning back to WWF. Uh, is that when he started the IRS gimmick? Uh, Spivey was up there. He was with Spivey. Uh, I don't know what he went to there. Probably the IRS. Then I remember you again coming back to WCW, I think it was. Well, Magnum had his wreck, and I went to Charlotte to see him. And uh, came back, and they asked me to come up there to work, so I went there. Mm. So that's when I went back to Charlotte, and I was there, well, until 90. Until 90. Yeah. The, uh, the, the uh, again, to give a fans some context here, uh, Magnum had been being built for the world title, yeah. and was just one of those studs in the ring, and this tragedy happens with this accident, and, uh, what always amazes me about him is, you know, because we, we have a tendency to get sucked into this business and mired in the business. But I look at a guy like uh, him, A, that he was able to get to that position in his career that quickly. Uh, just underscoring what a study was in the ring. Yeah. But something like that happening, especially that frame, the time frame in your life where you're this just incredible athlete on top of the world, and suddenly you're a, you know, a, a you know, but paralyzed, uh, it would be easy to succumb to that and just roll over and play the boo-hoo me role, right? Yeah. And instead, Magnum is, he's never stopped. No. Like, he's no. gone out and started companies. And, yeah, he's still going. Too. Yeah, it's still going strong. I mean, it's an inspiration to see. Yeah, he uh, is. Yeah, it's something else, right? And uh, I remember the one time in a dressing room, I can't recall where it was, oddly, the side that he was paralyzed on, he had no, he, he had feeling. But the side that he was paralyzed on, he didn't have feeling. So yeah. he was leaning against the griddle and it was burning his hand. He didn't even know it. And, I, and I, that sort of struck to me how cruel what had happened to him was. Uh, but again, in hindsight, looking at all, all he did and, uh, and still does, uh, amazing. Uh, what, uh, after you go back to Florida Championship Wrestling and now back to WCW, years. That's when I was there, uh, and I remember you being there. We were in Savannah, and this is when you were riding your hog around for most of the shows, and you just disappeared. And I never heard any story as to what had happened. Like you were booked on the show that night, and just were gone. What uh, year was that? 90? 90? 89, 90. Uh, what year? I left and I came back in 93. I'm, I'm Pretty sure it must have been the earlier run because Steamboat and I were together later, and, and you were, of course, there when we worked in uh, you and Dustin. Um, uh, I think it was in uh, Columbus, Georgia. I broke my wrist, I had to have surgery on this wrist. Yeah, I remember something about your hand, yes. Yeah. 
So I, I had the wrist broken in, so we did the arm, the angle with the arm to where he slammed it in the car door. And I went and had the surgery. And uh, uh, I think I was off about six or seven months with that. And did you go back then afterwards? Yeah. Because I, I must have been had left and, and, and wasn't aware that you had gone back. Yeah, I was back there. Uh, jumping probably two more years. Yeah. Well, because again, in 93, was when you and Dustin and working with me and Ricky and you turned heel. Uh, funny story about that. I've always wanted to tell you this story. My dad was, uh, uh, he was 48, 49 when I was born. So my dad was always the oldest dad around, but always best shape and all that. You're in incredible shape. Uh, I never knew my dad liked professional wrestling. Yeah. And and also I had not known until he died. And I found him in his footlocker. He had, he had lettered in wrestling all four years in high school, and had never told me his only son that he had wrestled amateur style all those years. But he used to take me to wrestling as a kid. And so now my dad's much older, a couple years before he died. Uh, and we have our match live on the uh, Clash of Champions. And if you recall, there was the commercial break, and then we had it back on set where you came in, waffled the chairs and everything. So I had run from the ring back to the payphone for a cell phone, and I called my dad. And he's crying because his son won a belt, right? I said, Dad, I'll call you back. I'm going to do something. I run back. And I call back five minutes later, right, after we get the sauce. And my stepmother answers the phone, and she said, your dad won't come to the phone. He threw an ashtray to the television. Because <laughs> <laughs> of you. <laughs> oh, but, but again, like, hey, doing good business thing, right? And the old man is buying it, so. It's, yeah. <laughs> it, uh, in hindsight, looking back over your career, uh, like Dominic had always mentioned this, like he'd always say, you know, coming from where he came from in Italy and through Canada, that he never regret, regretted being into the wrestling and that he was proud of what he had accomplished. Uh, looking back over your career, uh, any uh, misgivings? Would you have done something differently knowing what you know now? Probably not. Yeah, you know, I think about it all the time, but. You know, you got to think about where you are and what you're doing, and you know, I'm happy where I am. Yeah, I left a tiny bit of a legacy on the industry. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, you're, you're again, like you're one of those guys to make when everybody always asks you the, the, the ubiquitous question, right? Who's on your Mount Rushmore? Oh God, like the guys that we've known and worked with, right? Uh, but there, the, there are those handful of guys that sort of exceed beyond, like the Mount Rushmore stuff or whatever. To me, it's, it's as simple as who are the guys who admired, looked up to, liked their work, uh, and, and could actually watch and learn from. You were one of those guys for me, uh, again, because when you would watch you work, when you were selling, I was buying it. When you were firing, I was buying it. Uh, and again, could not take my eyes off of it. Um, with where the business has gone, uh, and I always ask the guys like my generation or thereabouts, uh, do you think the industry now, where it's going, where it's been, where it's headed, uh, do you think it's salvageable? It's never going to be what it was, and it'll probably evolve into something different than it is now. But, you know, especially with NBC and the big networks being involved in it. But, you know, it'll still say wrestling on, yeah. on the board and, you know, and there will be some semblance of wrestling, but I don't think it will ever go back. You know. See, the way I look at it is, again, I was so contingent on learning my craft from watching you, Terry, all these guys. That was how I learned. That was the, the that was my books that I was reading. Uh, 20 years from now, I hope we're all still around, and we may be, but my guess will be there will be fewer of us. Yeah. And 10, 20 years beyond that, we'll pretty much be could all be gone. Uh, the business, to me, I, I, I try, I guess, to analogize what, what I experienced and what I did to what I see others doing. And like I told you earlier, I was very well aware of what I didn't know. I didn't know how much I didn't know. I just knew I didn't know anything. Yeah. And uh, it, and so was the willing ear to all the all of you guys in the dressing room and with my eyes watching you guys. As a, when you were a kid in the business coming up, and you had a little bit different avenue because you were sort of immersed in that with all those guys. Uh, but was there a point, like in looking at it, uh, 
would you watch somebody, you'd go to the ring and get a certain reaction. Uh, and it may be this or maybe this, but then you'd see one of these other guys go over and just explode the place, right? Did that, like, sort of, to me what it would do is I'd watch it and it was like a puzzle. Like, what are they blowing them up? Why are, how are they getting that reaction and everything? Did that ever come to you like as, as a young guy in the business? Well, that was one of the things I learned from Eddie and Dusty is to watch every match. Mm -hmm. That way you don't do the same thing, you know, and, and you have a different match than the guy did before you or the guy did three matches before you. And uh, it, it made sense. And, you know, just, just by watching and watching the things that guys did in the ring, you know, it's just... It's just how I learned. Right, right. Uh, and see, it's something I can't come to an answer with, but it sort of scratches in my brain because I watch these kids with this astounding athleticism. And I'm thinking to myself, surely these kids at some point watched an Arn Anderson match, a Ric Flair match, a Ricky Steamboat match, whoever, fill in that blank. Are, are, are their brains not asking them the same questions that ours was asking us? What are they doing differently than I'm doing? Uh, you know, it's because like Dominic pointed out very often about these kids today. He watched them and he was impressed. But he would always say, my God, they're working 10 times harder than they have to. Well, to they're all raised on video games. Yeah. So they see the action in the video games. And, you know, I just think that has a lot to do with a lot of things going on in our society. You know, guns and everything. Right. You know, just so many of those games are so violent. And, yeah. Anyway, but I just think that's where it came from. Yeah. Right. Good point. Uh, with uh, how uh, you're, I see you periodically different things, and, and you're, you're dabbling around the business. I always tell fans you can never get it completely out of your blood. Your blood is, is part of us. Um, would you ever entertain the idea of maybe going to work for one of these WWE, uh, AEW? Because uh, to me, I can say again, I've I watched learning from you, I've watched listening to you, uh, and I desperately believe in my bones that the, the kids to me do need somebody like you and I both have. Yeah. Take you by the nose and then teach you a little bit. Uh, would that be anything that interests you? It would on a limited basis. I, I just can't travel like I used to. Right, right. <laughs> it's harder every day. Yeah, we don't love that. But yeah, I would. So, uh, final question, sort of a simple one. Uh, just your thoughts in general of having seen the things you've seen, done the things you've done, being Blackjack's uh, son, being Kendall's brother, being in the industry, and being one of the guys in the business, right? One of the guys that left a mark on the business and a legacy. What, how's that, how does Barry Windham assuage all that in his head? Like, how does that play out in your head? You know, to me, I just live every day, yeah. and and I just try to make it as easy as possible. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Uh, proud, uh, uh, stupid question, proud of your career. Uh, but do you look back and, and and even with all you've done, does it somehow seem to you like, like maybe it, it feels like a dream almost? Uh, you know, with, with all those experiences every night, and the, it's odd to me because when somebody will ask me a question, it's something that I thought about 30 years, but as soon as they ask that question, the memory's right there. Yeah. And you really get to relive that memory. Uh, do, you, do you do the same type of thing? Well, a, uh, a guy that I met at one of these uh, trade shows gave me a, a booklet, and it was supposed to be of all the matches that I'd been in. Wow. There was almost 4,000 of them. Wow. And uh, I was reading through it and looking through it, and there were just months on months that I had no recollection. Really? Of. But you look back, and, and then as you start remembering and looking at it, then you start remembering. You know, there's just so many memories. and Because you do almost the same thing over and over, it becomes, you know, methodical. Right, right. And then I guess you don't give as much thought to it, but not as much gets put away either. So. Right, right. Well, yeah, and I tell the fans a good bit of us, hey, do you have these tights or these good? No, they wore out of through a new new ones. They, we didn't think that way. It's, yeah. uh, but... Uh, Anyway, we've got a guy to talk to you all night, Barry, but I know you've got to get to a signing today. I really want to thank you for coming today with us, and and also thank you as allowing me to watch you and learn from you and, and, and pick the things up that I did. Uh, Barry Wooden, ladies and gentlemen, one of the guys that left a real mark on the business and 
one of the guys that to me made it a play to shoot. So appreciate it, Barry. Thank you very much. We'll see you guys here next week. Thank you.